Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Darwin. It's a privilege that I have now uh, to preach God's Word uh, to all of us here today. Now, we are reaching the end of our series on Jonah, and we're doing two chapters today, obviously, uh, as we have read and Ryan wonderfully read for us. And just to quickly give you a recap, if you've missed our last uh, the last two weeks, what we looked at, the book of Jonah, we've really discovered who God is um, through the story of Jonah. We met this terrifying God, the terrifying God who is the creator of heaven and earth, the God of heaven who made the seas and dry land, and this terrifying God who is in control of even the creatures of the sea, who sent waves and silenced them. And we find out that this God has revealed Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. He came on a boat where He silenced the wind and the waves. And we got the answer to a more important question, not just that He was a terrifying God that we need to revere and we need to respect and obey and listen to. We got the more important question asked, do you care about us? And the answer was, yes, of course He does. This terrifying God is a God who cares for us, and He's proven that on the cross. And last week, we found out more about this God because this is a God who actually rescues and saves, the God that we can call upon in our times of greatest distress, even, even when we call out to Him from the depths of the dead, the realm of the dead, even, even then we can still call out to Him. Even when the despair that we face is the very judgment of God, we can still call out to Him. Even when there seems to be no escape, we can still call out to Him. And that God has revealed Himself the God who will answer our call even when it feels like it's too late, that God has revealed Himself in Jesus Christ because it is His name now that we need a call to be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus, they will be saved. We're told about this God that we can call out to who revealed Himself in the person of Jesus Christ. But you know what? I think there's one more thing that this book has to tell us about God. And I think it's going to be really challenging. It asks us of the question, do you really know this God? Do you really know this God that you've heard about maybe in the last few weeks, but maybe it's a God that you've known for the most of your life? Do you really know Him? And in fact, the whole book of Jonah is designed to challenge that notion. It really asks the question, do you really know God? Have you really understood Him correctly? Uh, I'm doing premarital class at the moment. Three couples are getting married in the next uh, few months. It's always really nice to meet up with them. And, and uh, one of the things we do is we're setting expectations. I want to make sure that they got the right expectation going into marriage. And, and one of the false expectations that people have is going into marriage thinking that I know everything there is to know about my spouse. And some people will say, yes, I, I think I do. I think I know everything there is to know about my spouse. And I have, it's my job to tell them, uh, you're going to be disappointed if you think that way. Uh, if you are married, you know that... that that's actually never true. There are more things that you don't know about the person that you are about to marry. I think in the same way, the book of Jonah is letting us know. Maybe there's something that you don't quite understand about God. And I've already told you what it is from the title that He's a God of compassion, but in a way that you would never imagine. 
Let me pray, and we'll get into the passage. Gracious Heavenly Father, please help us now. We really need your word. We really need you to explain to us who you are. We want to hear from you. So please, please speak to us. Help us, Father, to leave this place not just deeper in knowledge, but deeper in our devotion and love and trust in you. Please show us Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This book is full of things that are completely unexpected, unimaginable things. It's, I think this book is designed to make us very uncomfortable, creates a lot of cognitive dissonance, makes us feel like, oh, that's not quite right. And chapter 3 does that really, really well. You would have noticed it in chapter 1 and 2, and I'll, I'll bring that up again later on. But chapter 3 does it really well. There's so many things that are unexpected. There's this unexpected, unimaginable, in fact, turn that happens here in these chapters. An unimaginable turn. Not just that as you've read, you would have known not just that the Ninevites relented or not just that the Ninevites turned around, but God also turned. He, he relented in, in the words uh, in this chapter. So we remember about Jonah who was so stubborn, he would rather die than go to Nineveh. He said to the sailors, just, just throw me overboard, I don't mind dying. Well, we find this maybe not so unexpected, but in a way, a little bit unexpected. He repented, he turned, he obeyed. It's a bit of a surprise, not totally shocking, but that's a real turnaround, isn't it? Verse 1, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Got a second chances. What did I say? Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim it to the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. He turned around. But then you sort of realize, oh, did he really turn around? Now, we're told it's a very large city. He walked a day into the city and gave the most amazing sermon ever preached. If being concise is a virtue, he is all about being concise. On a per-word basis, I think it is the most effective sermon ever preached, ever Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he said, and he left. And we found out he didn't just left and hung around in the city. He left the city, and he went up on a hill just to wait and watch. In the original Hebrew, it's actually only just five words. In the English, it's a little bit longer. But in the original Hebrew, it's only five simple words. And as you read this sermon, some, I, I know some of you are, are thinking right now, I wish this sermon was five words too. As you read it, you have to wonder if he's even trying. There's no attempt to persuade them to change. There was no introduction. There was no illustrations. There's no call to repentance. There's no explanation of God's wrath and, and why God will overthrow the city of Ninevites. He didn't even mention God. <laughs> There's no Thus says the Lord like the prophet of old. Now, at this stage yet, we don't know quite yet what Jonah is doing here. But whatever it was, here is a shocking turn. Five-word sermon, and the whole city believed. The Ninevites believed a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. The whole city turned around. They called a fast from the greatest to the least. Which, by the way, sackcloth is, is in the Bible a sign of mourning and a sign of repentance. They were really, really sorry. In, in a children's book, storybook of Jonah, it described it as they put on their really sorry clothes. It's nothing short of a miracle, really. If you want to talk about a revival, here is a revival. And later on, at the end of chapter 4, we realized that there, there were 120 plus thousand people in that city. That would have been a metropolitan city in the ancient world, and the whole city repented. That was a revival. 
from a five-word sermon. Imagine that. You know, I, I sometimes look at us and, you know, sometimes in evangelical circles, we love using the word revival. Oh, we want to have a revival and you have, you have a, a youth thing and thousands of youth comes and, oh, here's a revival. It's not a revival. Here is a revival. You know what's a revival in India right now? Um, I was just speaking to Stephen, who's really passionate about this work that was do, this going to be Stephen, um, Jenny's husband. And he was, he was talking about in India, there are tens of thousands of churches being planted right now. In the last few years, that's a revival. Here is a revival. 127,000 people saved in one day. But the, the passage doesn't just stop there. He, it elaborates even more. It wasn't just being sorry. They were calling urgently on God. Did you see that in verse 8? They were calling urgently on God. They were utterly dependent on God. In verse 9, I think that's the very definition of faith. They were solely dependent on God's compassion. Who knows? Maybe God will relent and with compassion turn His fierce anger so that we will not perish. It was utter dependence on God. It wasn't oh, maybe God will remember our good works because they didn't really have any. They were not only just feeling sorry, they were giving up their evil ways and their violence. There was a real turnaround in their behavior. In fact, it's almost ridiculous, and I think it's designed that way to make us feel like, what is going on here? It wasn't just the greatest king to the least. Even the animals were repenting. I think we're supposed to read this and go, what is going on in that city? This whole passage, this whole book, in fact, is just full of unexpected surprises. It's like you, you're pregnant and you thought you're having a girl and you bought all the pink clothes and the girliest girly clothes and you pick the beautiful girl's name that you won't tell anyone what it is because it's a secret. And when the baby is born, and it's a boy. It's a surprise. Everything in this book is upside down. We got a prophet in chapter 1 who runs away, who would rather die than deliver a message. And when he does, he gives this half-hearted, no-preparation sermon, five words in total. And we got Gentile sailors, remember in chapter 2, who recognize the terrifying God. They're the one who called out to God. They're the one who, who worshipped God and feared God. We got a, a fish swallowing a man. And that would have been certain death, but yet it's actually salvation. If you've been through the upside down house, I don't know, I've seen photos and Instagram people visiting the upside down house. It's a little bit like that. It's, it's so weird. It's, it's making you feel very unsettled. And here we've got the Ninevites, who, by the way, are notoriously evil and cruel. They were, I think, the ancient Near East version of our society, our age, when we say they are Nazis. If you were to think about the most horrible, cruel, evil group of people, it would have been the Ninevites. It's, it's as if God picked the worst of the worst, the most horrible people, just to prove a point here. The whole book of Jonah is designed to make you feel so uncomfortable. Nothing is as you expect it to be. It creates a cognitive dissonance. You're supposed to read this and really get a headache. Oh, one more thing. You know, back in verse 4, when it says, 40 days you will be overthrown, that word actually means turned. 40 days and you will be turned inside out. Now, it could mean you could be swallowed in by the earth. There will be an earthquake, you'll be swallowed in by the earth. But it just literally means you'll be turned inside out. And there's, there was a turn, wasn't there? There was a real turning, actually, a spiritual turning. But you know what? I think this is the most shocking of all. This is the most shocking turn. Here, in the last bit of chapter 3, verse 10 says, God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, and He relented. 
it made you wonder with the choice of word in verse 4, overthrown, meaning also just turned, it made you wonder if this is what God had intended all along. And if that is the case, let me just think hypothetically, if, if that's the case, that meant God actually sent Jonah to Nineveh to save them, to save the ultimate bad guys in the ancient Near East. God would actually go and save them, completely unexpected, unimaginable, really. That's chapter 3. It's supposed to make your stomach churn, but get ready for some more churning. Oh, I forgot to change the slide. There you go. God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, and he relented. Here's another unimaginable thing, an unimaginable response. Again, totally unexpected, an unimaginable response from Jonah and then again from God. Jonah's anger towards God, completely unexpected, makes you wonder what he's trying to do, and then God's unimaginable patience towards him. Here's what Jonah did. But Jonah, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. And that word that's translated in the NIV, very wrong, it's literally evil. He's basically saying what God did was evil. And that is the moment we should be going like, what? Are you sure you want to do that? It's like when you saw Will Smith climb up the stage and smack Chris Rock in the face. You go, that's happening in verse 1. Did he just call God evil? <gasps> and Jonah didn't even stop there. He even quoted the Bible. Did you notice verse 2? I knew that you were gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love. That's actually a quote from Scripture. That's how God introduced himself to the Israelites during the time of the Exodus. Tell them, the Lord has sent you. And when the Lord spoke to Israel, He said, I am the Lord your God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. And Jonah is using that and then throwing it to his face as an insult. I knew you were like that. That's why we find out in chapter 4 verse 2, that's why he was running away. He wasn't scared. It wasn't like he couldn't be bothered or he had something else to do in Tashis. He was running away because he did not want the Ninevites to be saved. He knew God wanted to save them. It was God's plan all along. He was so angry, he'd rather die. Now, whatever you say about Jonah, and by the way, he's not a is not a model to follow, an example for us to copy. But whatever you say about Jonah, he's got nerves of steel. Slept through a storm that God had sent because he ran away. He happily be thrown overboard. Just send me overboard and he will save you. And now he's climbing up the stage and smacking God in the face with God's own words. Completely, again, unimaginable. And again, it confirms what we, expect, what we suspected. God planned to save the Ninevites all along. And you know what else is unexpected, completely unimaginable, is God's response. At this moment, you know, I, I would have thought there would be thunder and lightning. He would have been, God would smite him from heaven right there and then. An earthquake will swallow Jonah alive. Or maybe God will send another giant creature and swallow him whole. But no, God's incredible patience showed forth, and He just asked a question. Is it right for you to be angry? You know what questions are for, right? When you're having a conversation, you ask a question. 
Uh, it makes you think. I've been training the leaders for the last few weeks, and one of the most important training that I, I've been helping them do is le- teaching them and, and helping them and training them um, to ask good questions. Because good questions get people thinking. It helps them reflect. It challenges them. It stops them from being comfortable with their own presuppositions. God's trying to get Jonah thinking. And I think He's trying to get us thinking too. Is it right for you to be angry? And then it's not just a question. He gave him an object lesson. He creates an opportunity for discipleship, for further learning for Jonah. He, God gives him a plant, they give him a shade, and then takes it away with a worm, and then sends a scorching east wind to make him grow faint. And now Jonah is even more upset, he'd rather die again. And God says, ask another question. Is it right for you to be angry with the plan? And Jonah, of course, he hasn't learned his lesson yet, obviously. He's not very self-reflective here, obviously. He just says, yes, I'm so angry. It is. It's right for me to be angry. I wish I were dead. And here's the clincher. Chapter 4, verse 10. The whole book just finished with God asking a question. And you sort of know if that is how the book finishes you know what the book is for. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend or make it grow. I, I, it sprang up overnight and it died overnight. There's a plant. Here today, gone tomorrow. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? And the book ends. We don't hear about the sailors. We don't hear about the Ninevites. We don't hear about Jonah. Because that's not the point. Here's the most important question. What do you think? Are you okay with God? I hope it makes you feel some discomfort. I hope you see how upside down this book is to make us feel unsettled so that we would stop and consider this question. Are you okay with a God like this? A God who would show compassion to the worst of the worst? Who sees and looks at these people, the Nazis of the ancient Near East, the worst of the worst, the cruelest, most barbaric people, and when God looks at them, God sees people who can't tell their right hand from their left hand. How do you feel about God's unimaginable capacity for mercy? Does it make you uncomfortable? I mean, we can spend a lot of time talking about, oh, Jonah just wants mercy and salvation for the Israelites. This is a racist thing. He needs to understand that God's love is for the world. Yes, all of that is true. But I want to ask you, how do you feel about God's capacity for mercy? It's a book that actually asks a question that tells you, look in your heart, how do you feel about Him? We're not done yet, because again, as usual, we need to put on our gospel glasses, we need to understand, how how does Jesus help us understand the book of Jonah better? We need to put on our gospel glasses, because we know God's revelation is interpreted through Christ and through the message of the good news of Jesus. And once we do that, we will be able to finally understand what the book of Jonah is all about. You put on your gospel glasses and you realize that this unimaginable God has actually come into the world. It's not just a question. It's not just a hypothetical. It's not just a consider an amazing proposition. What if God, the creator of the universe, is this 
is this amazingly compassionate. It's not hypothetical anymore because this God has walked the earth. How do we know this? I had a conversation last week, and, and someone asked, how do you know that? Darwin, how do you know that Jesus is truly the God that the Old Testament was talking about? How do you know? Because the answer is because time and time and time again, we see this same attitude, this same shocking, unimaginable compassion in Jesus. It's, it's like this, right? You, you're, you're meeting, say, for example, you're, you're dating someone you've never met before, and, and that person says, Oh, you know, I, I really, really, really like dogs. I really like dogs. That's something very important that you need to know about me. And then you finally met the person. And if that person that you met don't love dogs, you know, well, I don't think you're the, the same person. Am I being catfished? It's, it's really a sign to tell us this is, this is him. If you see him and he's come with lots of dogs, man, you really love dogs. I guess you are that person that I've been talking to. I think the book of Jonah is there so that we would recognize God when he comes. The one who has such shocking, unimaginable compassion towards people. the one who would do so and would really can forgive him. I'm going to give you a series of passages just to, to show you that Jesus is this God that Jonah is talking about. John 3, 16, we know this passage really well. For God so loved the world, the God who would love the world who would turn against him. And what does he do? He gave his one and only son. And have a look at verse 17. God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So sinners who believe in Him can have eternal life. In the very beginning of John, John's already telling us, this is the guy that you need to look to. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus was walking around and seeing all these people, He had compassion on them. They were harassed and hopeless like sheep without a shepherd. They don't know their left hand from their right hand. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. Jesus loved sinners so much so that, that people even mocked him and called him a friend of sinners. Verse 11, the Pharisees saw that Jesus was hanging around with tax collectors why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? He was so compassionate towards those who are the worst of the worst, the ones who do not deserve compassion, the one who you would never show mercy to, but Jesus welcomed them. In fact, the sinners were drawn to Him. He felt, they felt His compassion for them. He was like a doctor who came to seek out the sick, a Savior, calling for sinners, and they flock to Him. This is the God who is so shockingly compassionate to sinners. When He was hanging on the cross to die for our sins, who was there because not because of His own guilt, even then, He was asking His Father to forgive those who hung them on the cross. I like to think that I'm compassionate and kind and forgiving, but I'm not really. Um, saying sorry and saying I forgive you in our family is a big deal because I really believe in reconciliation and reconciliation requires confession, repentance, and forgiveness. We don't want to be a family who just shoves things under the carpet. And my kids know this, and, and they would come after doing something wrong, they would come to me and say, Daddy, I'm sorry. And I have to be honest, sometimes I'm still angry. Sometimes I'm, I begrudgingly say, 
I forgive you. Because I know that's what I want them to be doing. Sometimes I, I, I want to see that they're really, really sorry. I want them to grovel a bit, make myself feel a bit better. But Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus wants people to save. He wants to rescue them. He wants them to repent and turn. He came into the world. He emptied himself. He did not consider equality with God something to hold on to. He came into the world to save sinners. Jonah is there so that when Jesus came, we can go, there he is. That's that shockingly, unimaginably compassionate God that we find in the book of Jonah. It asks us that question, are you okay with it? It asks the question, should I care for these people? It makes you feel uncomfortable so that when this incredibly compassionate God came into the world, you can point to Him and say, that, that's Him. There He is. And so the first thing that we must do in response is turn and live. He's not a God who wants people to go to hell. Even in the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 18, the question rings through, why die? Why die, repent, and live, turn? God wants to rescue you. Not a God who takes pleasure in the death of anyone. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, if, if you haven't turned, turn and live. God wants to turn to you. He doesn't... He doesn't sit there with his arms crossed like me. I want to see how sorry you are first before I'll forgive you. We do that, don't we? Even before you came, his heart was already set on you. He is the dad in the story of the prodigal son who saw his son from very far away and pulled up his skirt and run through the mud to get to his son. Turn and live. Don't delay. But there's actually another application, and especially for all of us who, who claim to know God and who feels like, yeah, I, you know, Darwin, I'm, I'm really glad you said all those things. Other people need to hear it. I know God is compassionate. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know, I'm not uncomfortable with God saving sinners. I'm, that's, that's wonderful. You know, we look at Jonah and we, we can kind of go, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not like that. I mean, there is an application where you, where you have to ask the question, are there people in your life that you wish are not saved? Are there people out there in the world that you wish, like, God, you shouldn't save those people? I, I have a feeling that we're not like that. Um, jo we're not like Jonah. His reaction was totally overboard. If you are a Christian, you know and you probably appreciate God's compassion. We're not racist or nationalist. Uh, nationalist. We're not racist or nationalist. We need to learn that God has compassion for those who are different than us. I don't think we are like that. But I think, though... The question that God asks at the end of the book should make us think too and reflect really deeply. Let me ask you this question. Why is it that we are so fired up about evangelism when we first became a Christian, but then over time, it kind of fizzles out? We don't run away to the ends of the world, obviously. We don't do that. It's not like we, I'd rather die than see people say, obviously we're not doing that, but we can be indifferent. 
about it. We, we may not board a ship to go to the ends of the world to avoid evangelizing our neighbor, but we can be idle, we can be inert, we can say, oh, well, maybe later. We may not call God evil for saving people, but we make excuses for not proclaiming Jesus. I think the reason, the answer to that, this question, why, why do we, our fervor for evangelism fizzle allowed? I think the reason is the same. We, we don't quite understand who God is. We don't get Him. We don't quite understand and fully grasp the depth of His compassion. We don't realize that God in His inner core is gentle and lowly towards sinners, and He so desires to see them saved, to see them hear the gospel and turn and repent and have faith. And the reason for that, I think the reason it fizzles out from the moment we became a Christian, we're so excited and then it fizzles out, is because we, we forget how much God has loved us. We slowly become people who think, oh, you know, I'm not that bad. Because I'm not that bad, God's love must not be that deep. And because God's love is not that deep, surely God wouldn't want to save him. See the logic? Over time, we look at ourselves and we kind of go, you know, I'm, I'm not that bad. Whereas when we first became a Christian, we were so face-to-face -face with our own sinfulness that we understood and we felt the depth of God's compassion over us. But over time, that fizzles out. We start comparing ourselves with the world and we think we're not that bad. And because we're not that bad, God's love must not be that deep. And because God's love must not be that deep, then it's okay for that person to not be saved. Over time, we become like Simon in Luke chapter 7 who saw this woman completely sinful, wet Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Simon thought he was not that bad. And so he didn't quite get that Jesus had great compassion. I love the way it's described in verse 47. At chapter 7, verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. She knew the depth of her sin. And that's why she responded that way. But we who have forgotten the depth of our sin, we love very little too. And so we don't go to our neighbor and tell them, that God is compassionate. Friends, I hope you are challenged by Jonah. I hope you take that next step in going deeper and understanding how deep God's compassion is for the world. I hope you see in your life the depth of your own sin and see how God's compassion has reached down to save you. And I hope that death will make you reach others and tell them about the God of compassion. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks Please help us consider who you are more, understand how deep your love is for us. So we might be moved to desire others to be saved too. Remind us, Lord. Point us to our need for you, how deep that is. 
Most importantly, help us to know how great your love is for the world. Help us to be moved to reach our neighbors for Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen.